So in this video we're going to be examining the um, drainage basin hydrological cycle and we're going to be thinking about the movement of water um, on a small scale within one individual drainage basin. Now it's important that we start by thinking about the definition of a drainage basin. How do we actually um, define that term? Well a drainage basin um, is the area of land that is drained by a river and its tributaries. So in the example that we've got um, on the screen here, we can see that we've got several tributaries flowing down, joining together, um, forming up with this main river channel, and that water is eventually flowing out to sea at the mouth of the river here. Okay, so it's being fed in by all these different tributaries, feeding water into the main river channel. Any water that falls within inside this dotted line is going to, at some point, either end up in that river or certainly going to be part um, of that drainage basin system. So if we imagine we had some rainfall and we had a drop of rain that fell here, um, that water is now part of this drainage basin and it might make its way um, across the surface and into one of the, the tributaries. It might um, soak into the soil and make its way into the river that way. Um, but once that rain has fallen within that dotted line, um, that is part of that drainage basin. We sometimes refer to this um, also as a river catchment. That's a, another term you might come across. Um, and again, the idea that you know the water that's caught within that region, um, within that area, ends up in that river. Any water that fell outside of that drainage basin, so outside of that dotted line, like here, for example, um, that's part of a different drainage basin and might flow off somewhere else um, to become part of another river that's maybe flowing down um, in a different direction. And likewise, if some water fell over here, that might be part of a, div a different river system that might take it somewhere else. So a drainage basin is a small area of land um, that's drained by a river um, and any water that falls in that drainage basin becomes part of that system. The term that we use for the edge of the drainage basin, um, we can see here the term watershed. That's this sort of imaginary line um, that separates one drainage basin from another. It's normally marked by a series of maybe hills or mountains or something like that. Um, so that water that falls on one side of that hill is going to end up in one drainage basin and water that falls on the other side of the hill is going to end up in a different drainage basin. When we think about the movement of water within a drainage basin, there are lots and lots of different bits of key terminology that you need to be um, familiar with. I'm not going to go through all of those definitions now in this video, um, but it is important that um, you've got a very thorough um, glossary of these key terms so you're happy with their meanings and you're happy when you come across them maybe in things that you're reading or questions that you're answering um, and certainly that you're happy enough to be able to use these kinds of words when you're giving your own answers so we want to be using um, you know terms like interception for example um, or infiltration um, or percolation or surface runoff. We want to be using these terms within our answers um, rather than saying things like, oh, the water soaks into the ground. We want to make sure that we're using the term infiltration. So we can think about this movement of water um, as being a system um, with inputs um, and outputs and stores um, and flows or transfers between them. This diagram on the left hand side and this diagram on the right hand side are showing you the same thing. This is one on the left hand side, it's just maybe a little bit more um, uh, descriptive in terms of actually you can see um, that interception, for example, refers to the trees um, and infiltration, for example, refers to the soil. So a system has inputs and outputs um, and stores and flows and we need to be happy with how the water moves about within this system. The only input into our drainage basin system is precipitation. That is the only way in which water can be added into a drainage basin. It can't flow up and over a hill and into the drainage basin through the watershed. It's only able to get into there um, through rainfall or snowfall or other forms of precipitation. That precipitation then goes on a bit of a journey, um, ultimately um, probably making its way um, into um, a river, which is going to take it towards the sea. Um, that's one of our outputs 
which we can see on um, this diagram here is, is called river discharge. That's what we call um, the output of water from a river into the sea. We call it discharge. Um, or before it gets there, that water might end up back in the atmosphere, either through um, evaporation or through transpiration. Um, sometimes you'll come across these terms um, as a kind of collective term that we call evapo transpiration okay um, that is a collective term um, for all of the water lost through evaporation and all of the water lost through transpiration so evapotranspiration um, is another output um, of the drainage basin system so for example some rain could fall as precipitation it might be intercepted by um, the leaves of a tree and then it could just be evaporated again back into the atmosphere or it might find its way onto the surface and infiltrate into the soil and then flow horizontally down slope through the soil in that process of through flow and end up in the river where it might then be evaporated again or it could be discharged out to sea. So we can think about this hydrological cycle um, as being a little bit of a journey with some um, stops along the way. Those stops are the stores and the movement between those stops um, are these flows and transfers that we have on here, things like surface runoff or groundwater flow. They're moving the water um, from one of these stores to the next. The other important thing to remember about the drainage basin hydrological cycle um, is that it's an open system. So the water um, can come into and out of that system as well as the, as the energy. So we have inputs of precipitation and we have outputs of water in the form of evapotranspiration um, and river discharge. So the, on a local scale, a small scale like a drainage basin, the water cycle here is an open system. Another thing that we need to be familiar with regarding drainage basins is the concept of um, the water balance. Now, if we turn our attention to this equation here to start with, this equation here describes um, the water balance. So on one side of that equation, we have precipitation, okay? We have our input into um, the drainage basin. That's the only way that water can get into a drainage basin, remember, is through precipitation. On the other side, um, we have our outputs. Um, in this case, Q represents river discharge or runoff, um, and E represents evapotranspiration, that process, remember, combination of evaporation and transpiration. So on here, on this side of the equation, we have our outputs, okay? And as the word balance suggests in this equation, the inputs have to equal the outputs. So in order for that to happen, sometimes we might need to be adding or removing water um, from storage. OK, um, the storage in this case um, is the soil um, and the rocks within the drainage basin. So the soils and rocks act as the storage. And if, for example, precipitation in one month was quite low and there wasn't very much precipitation, but there was still quite a lot of evapotranspiration, then in order to make that work, in order to make that water balance equation balance, we'd have to get some water from somewhere to compensate for the lack of precipitation. And that water would be drawn up out of the store, yeah, out of the soil and rocks within the drainage basin. What we can see here um, is a typical graph of what the water balance might look like for somewhere in the UK. We can see that um, the temperature um, is a bit warmer in the summer and it's a bit colder in the winter. And that helps us to understand maybe some of the changes that we can see um, throughout the year. Broadly speaking, this is the case for lots of the UK, um, it's wet all year round. So in this case, we have precipitation indicated by the blue line. We have that in every month of the year. There's a little bit less rainfall in the summer months and there's a little bit more rainfall in the winter months. So we have this kind of dip in the rainfall as we go from winter into the summer 
and then back to the winter again. We also have quite a significant change in the rate of evapotranspiration. That's indicated by the yellow line on this graph. And we can again think about the fact that changes in the seasons and the temperature are driving these changes in evapotranspiration. So we have more evapotranspiration in the summer because the temperatures are warmer, that's encouraging more evaporation. And we have more transpiration at this time of year because the trees all have their leaves in the summer um, and that is a way in which um, trees are returning water to the atmosphere. In the winter, when deciduous trees lose their leaves, so in November or December here, um, deciduous trees are not going to have their leaves and that's going to prevent them from um, returning any water back to uh, the atmosphere through transpiration. Now depending on the balance between the inputs of precipitation and the outputs of evapotranspiration and runoff, we're going to end up with different um, things going on over the year, different stages um, in this case of um, the water balance. Okay, so we've got four stages of the water balance. We have surplus, utilisation, deficiency, um, or sometimes you will come across this um, uh, as the word deficit, um, or recharge. So four different situations we can be in. If we start the year off um, in January, we can see that in January, precipitation is higher than evapotranspiration. So we've got more coming into the drainage basin than we've got going out. Um, what this will lead to over time um, is a surplus of water. We can see that stage A here is this blue color, which indicates a surplus of water. That means that there's excess water in the drainage basin, um, more than the soil needs, more than the plants need, and therefore that's gonna be running off into rivers um, and it's going to be filling up um, the groundwater below. As we move throughout the year though, we can see that that precipitation starts to fall and evapotranspiration starts to rise until we get to this crucial point here where evapotranspiration overtakes precipitation, where our outputs overtake our input. So now we've got more leaving the drainage basin than we've got coming in. And what will happen as a result of this um, is we'll start to enter this, this phase of soil moisture utilisation. Um, what happens here is that water is then drawn out of the soil in order um, to actually make the equation that we were looking at earlier balance. So because there's more going out than there is coming in, that water is going to be drawn out of um, the soils and we call that soil moisture utilisation. That's going to continue right the way through to the summer months um, until we get here to point C, um, when actually all of that soil moisture has now been used up. You can imagine that we've drawn as much water out of the soil as we can, and that soil is going to be, going to be completely dry. And we'll then enter a stage um, of deficiency, or as I said before, sometimes we'll see um, this referred to as deficit. Okay, there is a deficit of water. There is not enough water in that drainage basin. And that will happen until the point when these two lines cross over again, until precipitation starts to overtake evapotranspiration. And this time, we've now got more going into the drainage basin than we've got coming out of it. What that will mean is that we start to enter this fourth phase which is what we call soil moisture recharge. Okay, the um, soil is filling back up again. It's the water is making its way back into the soil and um, it's filling it up until such time as we get to this stage here, F, which refers to uh, what we call the field capacity being reached. Basically, the soil is now saturated and we go back into that stage um, of water surplus. Um, I sometimes like to think about this a little bit like your mobile phone battery during the day where you might start the day with quite a full battery and as you go through the day um, you're using up that battery and you're using it up and you're using it up until you completely run out of battery and then you plug it back in again and you 
battery charges up and then your battery is full. That's exactly what's happening here in a typical year within um, the UK. Depending on the amount of water that we get added in through precipitation, we don't always get this um, stage of deficit. Um, the UK is actually wet enough to mean that in most years that might not necessarily happen. Um, in drier parts of the world they could have deficit for um, quite a significant period of time. And that's another important thing to remember about the water balance, that it varies from place to place and from year to year. So this is a typical example of what the UK might, or Southampton in the UK might look like, but in any given year, the rainfall levels might be different and the temperatures might be different. So the actual data would look different from, from year to year. But broadly speaking, um, the pattern in the UK would be the same. However, in different parts of the world, that pattern can look very different. So if we have a look at this um, graph on the left hand side here. This shows you the, um, the water balance for somewhere um, a little bit warmer than the UK. So this is the water balance um, for somewhere in Ghana in Africa. And we can see they've got their precipitation um, much, much higher in this kind of rainy season and then almost no um, precipitation in this dry season here. And they have a huge period of soil moisture deficit yeah, for one, two, three, four, five, six, nearly seven months of the year. There's a deficit, um, a very brief recharge, a very brief surplus um, and then a smaller period of utilisation. So because the climate's different, the um, precipitation and temperature are different and therefore um, the soil moisture balance, the water balance is going to be different here as well. Same with this location in New York, because the precipitation is always quite high and is always higher than evapotranspiration, because this dotted line never gets above this one, there is only ever um, a surplus in this location. Whereas um, in this part of Texas in the USA, um, where rainfall levels are much, much lower and evapotranspiration is much, much higher. There is no period of surplus in this location. There is only recharge, utilisation and deficit. There's no surplus of water. So as I said, this is all because the climate of an individual region and the variations in their weather patterns from one year to the next mean that the water balance will look different um, from one year to the next and from one place to the next. So that brings us to the kind of summary stage of this drainage basin hydrological cycle then. So um, in an individual drainage basin, uh, the water cycle is an open system. We have inputs, flows, stores, um, transfers of and outputs of water as well. There are lots of different key bits of terminology associated with um, the drainage basin hydrological cycle. Um, so it's important that you're able to confidently use those bits of key terminology and be able to give definitions of them um, and describe those processes. The water balance describes the difference between the inputs and outputs within a drainage basin. And that water balance um, has four stages and that can vary um, from year to year or from place to place.